Hello, good morning. This is Taiba at Taibs.com. And today we're going to continue our study on the book of 1 John. Now, on last week we looked at 1 John 1, verse, verses uh, 1 through 4. And today we're going to look at verses 5 uh, through 10. And the title that I chose is, Are You Walking in the Light? This is important. And I want to give you a background before we get into looking at uh, those verses. So basically, um, as we looked at uh, 1 John 1 verse 1 through 4 last week, we concluded that the Apostle John was establishing at the outset that the Jesus whom he and the other, uh, the other disciples ex experienced was indeed the Christ. So John presented the empirical evidence as well as the backing of Scripture. So he wasn't just relying on his experience with Jesus, but he was also saying that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. He fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. So um, what I want to do today is this. I want to give you a quick uh, background into entering uh, uh, verses 5 through 10. So one of the things that John, John was doing when he was writing that epistle, he, was, he wanted to counter false uh, teaching because there were false teachers that had come into the church and they were preaching pretty much uh, Gnosticism. And we talked about what Gnosticism is. Basically, they were wrapped up in some kind of mysticism. They denied the physical body. They're saying that whatever you do with your physical body doesn't really matter. All that matters is your spirit and your 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 connection with God. So they were all they were like putting a lot of emphasis on experiences that were like weird. And we, we see a lot of narcissism today in our churches. There's a lot of things that are happening in churches that are really not biblical. They're not scriptural. So John, when he was writing this, this chapter, he was actually attacking that kind of mindset. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And, and this, these uh, Gnostic uh, teachers, they were promoting uh, licentious living. And you can see how that can destroy the integrity of the church. So John was like set on a mission. He wanted to refute those guys and he wanted to expose their lies. So that's the background, basically. So let's get into uh, the verses. So I'm going to go verses uh verses by verses okay so we're gonna start with verse five now this is what john says in verse five this is the message we've heard from him and proclaimed to you that god is light and in him there is no darkness at all so that's what john says about what jesus told them about god okay so basically john is telling his audience i'm relaying a message that i've heard from jesus this is what jesus told us that jesus is the christ so basically, remember, he, he established at the outset that Jesus is indeed the Christ. And since Jesus is the Christ, he constitutes the absolute in the sense that whatever Jesus says is what goes. In other words, the only teaching that matters is the teaching of Jesus. Nobody else's teaching ma matters but Jesus' teaching. So now we're going to look at Isaiah 5.20 to understand what it means for God to be light. In Isaiah 5.20, the prophet says, Woe to those who, go, who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Basically, what Isaiah the prophet is doing is this. He's doing a contrast between light and darkness, evil and good. So basically, he's putting an emphasis on there has to be a distinction, a clear distinction between what is evil and what is good. And he's saying some people have twisted things up. What is evil, they call good. And what is good, they call evil. And what is light, they call darkness. And what is darkness, they call light. And he also uses uh, bitter and sweet. Basically, he's putting that contrast there for us to understand what it means to for God to be in the light. Basically, what we can infer from this is this. The best human definition we can have is that God is the epitome of all that is good. God is... The epitome of all that is right, all that is lovely. There is no imperfection in God. God is morally perfect. There is no trace of evil in God, not even one ounce of evil in God, because he is God in essence. Basically, God is good. He is good in essence, what I'm saying. He is good. This is who God is. God is good. No one is righteous like God. No one is as good as God, because God is the definition of what is, whatever is good, whatever is lovely, whatever is perfect. God is good. God is light. So, and, and then let's go to, and then we're going to jump to verse 6 because he has to establish at the beginning because John has to, he's, he's trying to let his, his audience know, listen, 
God is light. God is good. There is no traces of evil in God at all. Okay? So in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So what does that mean? What does that mean? We have to go to 2 Corinthians 6 and 14. Paul tells us, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So basically, John is basically exposing the Gnostic teacher's lies. Basically, he's saying this, No one who claims to be in an intimate relationship with God we live in continual licentious living. No one who truly abides in God will throw off all moral restraints. It's an impossibility. There is no fellowship with light and darkness, so that those who insist on living in darkness and claim to be children of God are liars. Okay? And we see that today. And, and here's the thing. like, Let me pause for a second. You have a lot of people in churches Okay, they're going there, and there are manifestations. Now, I don't know if those manifestations are from the Spirit of God, or I don't know wh where those manifestations are coming from. So they put so much emphasis on those manifestations, but yet there is no fruit of the Spirit in their lives. They talk about the dreams that they've had, and their unspiritual mind puffs them up with these false notions. So you can see the lie, because you continue to live in sin, and then you have these experiences. So basically. You put your emphasis on the experience and you deny the, uh, um, your, your body in the sense that what you do with your body doesn't matter anymore. So you think, well, I'm still a child of God. Meanwhile, you're living in sin. So there is no, um, there is no connection between living in the light and living in darkness. There is no fellowship with that. And that's what John is saying here. You can't claim to be in the light and continue to live in darkness. And the deeds of darkness are pretty clear. That licentious living and licentious uh, um, uh, throwing off all moral restraints. And this is what John was really attacking in this passage. Okay? Now, here's the thing. John also has some people in mind, genuine believers. They may see his words and, and then begin to get really frightened because sometimes you are struggling with sin. Okay? You are a genuine believer, but you have a struggle. You, you don't want the sin in your life and you, you don't know how to deal with it. So John has those people in mind, and he's going to address them in verses 7. So let's go to see what verse 7 says. So in verse 7, we read uh, the following. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have a fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Basically, one another means God. Okay, We have fellowship with God and one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin if we walk in the light. So what does that mean? John is saying that the person that walks in the light, the person that walks in accordance with the word of God, because we're going to read in Psalm 119 verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So basically John is saying the person that walks in the light, walks in accordance with the word of God, will experience true fellowship with God. Why? Because that fellowship will result in conviction, confession, discipline, cleansing, repentance, and sanctification. For God disciplines those he accepts as sons and daughters. No one who is in true fellowship with God can continue to live in licentiousness. No one who is in true fellowship with God can continue to live in sin. There will be discipline from the Lord. That's how we get authenticated. And I want us to go to Hebrews 12 verse 4 through 11. To understand this better. Listen to what the scripture says in Hebrews 12 verses 4 through 11. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when reproved by him, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and sons. You know, illeg illegitimate children and not sons. 
Besides this, we have we've had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. Okay? For the moment, all discipline seems painful, rather than pleasant. But later, he yields to peaceful fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Basically, that's what John is trying to convey here. John is trying to say, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we are a fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So if you are in true fellowship with God, God will not let you get away with live, living without any kind of accountability. You're going to be exposed to the word of God, and the word of God is going to cut you to the heart, and that's going to cause you to repent of your sin. And then when you confess your sins, you get cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So basically, he's, he's talking about, again, you, you have to remember, what we have at stake here is that the false teaching from the Gnostic, uh, Gnostic teachers. They were pretty much saying that it doesn't matter what you, what, what, what you do with your body. And, and John is refuting that with every scripture and every verse that we see here. He's saying you can't be in fellowship with God and continue to live in sin. Because if you're truly in fellowship with God, the word of God will expose your, your darkness. And then, guess what? You're going to repent of it. Okay, so he's not saying that you are sinless, but he's saying that if you, when you sin, you're going to be exposed, you're going to be disciplined by God, and that's going to lead to repentance, that leads to righteous living. Let's keep going. Verse 8. So, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, there's two kind of people. Now, John also has some folks in mind who might have like a very shallow and narrow view of the righteousness of God. These are folks who may appear like religious and do all the external like right things, but have a very shallow view of the nature of God and his righteousness. Because if you truly understand what Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 says, it says this, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is something that no one can achieve unless they are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. In the sense that only God can do this. What God is demanding here is absolute devotion, dedication to his, uh, his kingdom day and night. And Jesus is the only one that truly lived it out. So when we say we have no sin, we are basically saying, we are basically denying this. And we deceive ourselves. And you are deluded. Okay? So Jesus said somewhere, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisee, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That's in Matthew 5 verse 20. So basically the Pharisee had like this uh, shallow view of the righteousness of God. So Jesus takes that to a, a higher level. He's saying, listen, if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the Pharisee, because they were considered the standard, you will not enter the kingdom of God. So if we say we have no sin, we are deluded. You, de you deceive yourself. And this is what John is trying to communicate here because he knows that there are some people that have this self-righteousness and he's attacking that as well. Okay, so let's go to uh, verse 9. So the scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So John is, is reporting everything Jesus told them about God and Jesus modeled his own life because he is God. Okay, Jesus modeled his, his, his own life because he is God. He modeled the life that God desires because he is God. And remember what he told uh, Thomas. He said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's in John 14 verse 9. Okay, because Jesus said to John, uh, Thomas was like, show us the Father. And Jesus said, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Oh no, it was Philip. I'm, I'm sorry, Philip. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me the Father? Okay? So basically, John tells us that if we truly come under conviction and confess our sins, God promises to forgive us because he is faithful to his word and he maintains the integrity of his character. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for your sins and my sins. And he said, it is finished. So when you confess your sins, God forgives you and God forgives me on the basis of the finished work of Christ. So he, God upheld his justice by nailing Jesus on the cross. 
God was maintaining the, his just character. He wasn't just going to let sin slide by. So this is why Jesus had to die. Because God was also maintaining his justice. And then when we confess our sins, he forgives us because he made a provision for us through Jesus Christ. And he's faithful to his words. Because God made that provision and God said, if anybody confess their sins, then I'll forgive them on the basis of Christ's work. And God maintained his, the integrity of his character by upholding his merciful attribute, his uh, justice attribute as well. Okay, and he forgives us and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So not only does God forgive us, but he also cleanses us, okay, from our sin so that we can have fellowship with him, so that our fellowship is not broken. So this is so important to understand that. Like even I struggle to understand that. Like you have you have like the intellectual knowledge, you get it, but sometimes you have to live it out. It's one thing to understand it in your mind, it's another thing to live it out and to actually live because you believe it. Okay, when you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you. Because if he doesn't cleanse you, then you have no fellowship. Because God is holy. You have to understand that. And let's go to the last verse, verse 10. So if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So basically, again, he's going back to what he said earlier. John is saying that when we claim that we are sinless, we basically make God a liar. God is the standard for all that is right. So when he declares someone guilty of sin, God is right when he declares you and I guilty of sin. And here, what, you know, you have to know what God said about mankind. There is not, none righteous, not even one. That's Romans 10 and 3 verse 10 to 11. No one is righteous. So if we claim that we are sinless, we are essentially saying that God is lying. So, and this is what John is saying here. Okay, guys. And then, so what can we learn from all these things? My question is this. Don't just read these words and just go home and forget about it. Are you walking in the light or are you still in darkness? John gives us the criteria. How do you know that you're living in the light? John tells you if, you, if you claim to be in the light while you walk in darkness, you deceive yourself. Because if you're truly walking in the light, you're going to come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit and there's going to be repentance and there's going to be change and there's going to be a desire for righteous living. Because we are called to examine ourselves to see if we are truly in the faith, to, to test the genuineness of, genuineness of your faith. So I'll encourage you to do that. Because if you're not being disciplined by God, if you if you find yourself constantly like resisting the word of God, if you find yourself hating the word of God, if you're living in sin and you're not bothered by it, chances are you are not saved. Okay? And I will encourage you to test yourself through the word of God because this is important. You know, you don't want you don't you don't want to deceive yourself. You don't want to be deluded. Because a lot of people live like that. You live in open sins and it doesn't bother you. And you may have some experiences at church. You may go to church and sing songs and maybe you may even shed tears while you're preaching or while you while you're singing. And that that you you think just because you shed a tear. Therefore, you're okay because the Holy Spirit has given you that. You may be deceiving yourself. Maybe it's just your own emotions playing tricks on you. Okay, so how do you know that you're living in, in, in the light? Are you constantly walking in the light? Are you constantly coming under the authority of the Word of God? And is the Word of God causing you to repent? Repent and believe the gospel. That's the whole thing. Is come under the, the, the mighty hand of God. Humble yourself and let God search your heart. And bring out those things that he doesn't like so that you can confess it so that your fellowship with God is continual. But if you don't do that, you just live your life, you think you're okay, and you deceive yourself because you have experiences. That is not walking in the light. Walking in the light doesn't mean that you are sinless. But it does mean that you come and you confess it, and then you get cleansed, and then you live righteously because the sanctification process is evidence of the work of God in your life. Are you sinning less? And are you desiring to be more like God? Because if you truly are a child of God, guess what? You're going to long after the things of God. But if you continue to long after the things of the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. So I'll encourage you to go back and read that chapter again. And hopefully it makes uh, more sense to you. Have a wonderful day and I'll see you next time on chapter 2 of First John. Okay? Thank you.